So I'd, I'd like to just basically outline the, the, the overall perspective of the retreat. Um, I should say right at the very beginning, um, I'm not a scholar, and this is not going to be a scholarly uh, view of the Buddha's life with lots of sort of references and uh, lots of Pali and Sanskrit. Um, I should also say my, my pronunciation of Pali and Sanskrit is not good, so definitely do not go on any of my pronunciations. Um, I would double check them. Um, So yes, so it's going to be a poetic, experiential, um, imaginative, creative look at, at, at the Buddha's life story and these turning points. Because um, obviously the Dharma's communicated in, in many different ways. The, the Buddha spent his entire life trying to communicate something that's very, very difficult to communicate. You know, um, so he, he sort of tried it this way, he tried it that way, he tried it very cognitively with very clear rational thinking. He also communicated it very poetically through images and stories and he also communicated it obviously in his very being, in the way, the way he was in the world, how he related to people. It's very sort of, it's almost his energetic presence. And different people, this allowed different people to have their different responses. And that's why uh, we've got this incredibly rich tradition of the Dharma that, that we have. Um, and one way that I particularly respond to Mandarava too is this more sort of imaginative way of responding to the Dharma, this more imaginative way of communicating the Dharma th through, through, through images and stories. And what I should say very importantly, when I use the word image, I don't necessarily just mean a picture. Um, and, and an image is, is a poetic way of communicating a truth. So in this way of talking, a, a piece of music is an image, uh, a poem is an image, a novel is an image or a series of images. They're these um, the things that kind of resonate with the heart. Because this whole approach really is about uh, a communication with and through the heart. Um, and I really believe that by doing this, we, um, we really engage our emotions in practice that become the kind of engine and fuel of our practice. If, if our practice is just in our heads, it'll only take us so far and we'll run out of steam. Now... As I'm sure most of you know, um, the Buddha lived in a time of, of an oral tradition um, two and a half thousand years ago. Things were very, very rarely written down. Um, in fact, there were kind of beliefs that, that writing somehow debased sort of esoteric truths. Um, writing was something that kind of merchants did. You know, you, you, you recorded how many grains of corn you'd got or whatever. Um, so it was an oral tradition and nothing was formally written down for between three and five hundred years after the, um, after the Buddha's Paranirvana. So we've really got to bear that in mind when we're looking at the, the history of the Buddha that we've inherited. Um, and we really have to bear in mind that, that what we call Buddhism is, is a human construction it's two and a half years of, of, of people trying to work something out together. Um, so, and this is really, in, in one way, one of the, the, uh, the great assets of the Dharma is the fact we, we can't really, if we're going to honour the Buddha's legacy, there's no such thing as a Buddhist fundamentalism because we have no idea what this kind of fundamental truth is. Um, there, there's much of the early teachings of the Buddha were he'd include little kind of snippets of he'd tell anecdotes like we all do he'd say you know it was a bit like when I was a boy and or you know um, 
So he tell these little kind of anecdotes while he was communicating the Dharma. And in, in the earliest um, parts of the Pali Canon, you get these kind of little snippets of, of stories. And the kind of more kind of linear life story in, in a text come much, much later. And they tend to be um, quite mythological in character. And for some people, there, there can be a perception that somehow it becomes more and more sort of untrue. Um, and, and obviously, th there is some truth in that. But I think it's really important to also bear in mind that there, there's, there's a different kind of, um, there's a different sort of truth that's also available to us. There's a, this mythologizing um, communicates a, a, the deeper truth. Um, it often communicates the sort of the inner truth, the inner experiences through, through images. Um, because you also get this experience in, in the Pali Canon and the Buddhist tradition where, you, again, you get these kind of multiple perspectives on things. There, there are these different ways in, these different, um, almost like eyewitness accounts of what, of what occurred. And they're not, they're not identical. Um, so you have to kind of, um, you sort of take this field of truth and you, or truths or experience, and then you kind of think, well, the truth's kind of somewhere possibly in the middle there. Um, and of course, that's a very, it's not a precise art. Um, there's no sort of single true version. I think this is a very, very important point. There's no single true version. I was thinking about, at the moment, there's quite, um, culturally, there's quite a tradition, isn't there, of, of, of the biopic, you know, of all, all the the television series that's based around someone's life. You know, I can think of examples like The, the Crown and uh, the success of that film about the band Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody. And they present kind of supposedly what happened. But of course, if like me, you sometimes watch these things and then you get on Google afterwards and you check, you find out that the, the storytellers have glued together all sorts of different um experiences often they change the order of things to create a more kind of harmonious narrative um or the people you know they'll turn one of the characters into a real a complete out and out villain for example that's something that often happens but of course people are complex people do unskillful things and they do skillful things no one's 100 percent unskillful um so it's always worth remembering that these narratives are a construction. Um, they're a fabrication in the, in, in, in the Dharmic sense, um, which isn't to dismiss them, but you just, I think it's very important to have that perspective. Um, and I think the, these mythic kind of stories survive because they do actually hold an archetypal truth they 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 say something very deep about what it means to be a human being um because and we can tap into that and we can resonate with that now um these truths are kind of timeless in a way and they tend to repeat they even repeat in the buddha's life story um, so there's an interesting thing when you start to explore myth, time starts to do very strange things and you start to see that there's, that time's more flexible and strange and does, isn't clear and linear. Um, there's a, there's a lovely quote from, um, Celestius, I think that's how you pronounce it, who is a ancient philosopher. And he said, myths are things which never happened, but always are. Myths are things which never happened, but always are. Um, so these, these kind of archetypal truths um, are present in any moment. And they also can, can repeat. And this is something we'll, we'll explore on the retreat. So to give an example... 
a uh, huge turning point in, in the Buddha's life is um, the going forth uh, when, when he leaves home. Now, it can sometimes be seen that that's an event that just happens the once. It's just, a, um, it's just the one going forth that happens. Um, but actually, as most of us have experienced probably in our lives, there's lots of different times and places where there's a need to move away from something towards something more helpful, positive, constructive, skillful. And there's a sense of needing to leave something behind and that can be very, very painful and very difficult. So going forth doesn't just happen the once. It happens in a moment-to-moment -moment way. Um, I, can, I can choose in this moment, am I going to stay in a habitual way of uh, relating to the world? Or am I going to move towards something more creative, more open, more spacious? Am I going to uh, just stay in a habitual state? Or am I going to move towards the unknown and the creative, which is obviously quite scary um, because it's familiar. I mean, we'll explore this further in a few days' time. So going forth is something we're doing kind of now. Um, or has we have the possibility to, I should say. Um, so these these kind of moments or these points, these turning points that that I've we've chosen to to particularly uh, explore and go into, um, they could be seen as um, rites of passage. Um, it's a sort of anthropological term in that most cultures have what's called rites of passage where the significant turning points in a life are, are, are marked. Um, christenings, bar mitzvahs, um, you know, freshers week at university, they're all kind of got their ritualized aspects. Um, funerals um, and some of these things are quite consciously marked like say a bar mitzvah um, and others like Freshers Week at university have a kind of their own um, kind of informal sort of law as in L-O-R-E that has developed and a sort of tradition has developed to mark those points um, and some of those rites of passage have a very positive quality and some of them have not so positive aspects to them. But I think a genuine rite of passage uh, marks a move from a more limited perspective to a greater perspective, to a bigger perspective. Um, it's, it's the symbolic acknowledgement that we're on a threshold and we're going to move from what we know into the unknown and into something bigger. Um, so these rites of passage are always can be um, quite threatening to our fixed sense of self. I think that's why they're so so important and significant because we're go we're always going to be moving from the known to the unknown. Um, and for me, these uh, turning points in the Buddhist life mark those points where his perspective changed, where his perspective became bigger, deeper, wider, higher, whatever kind of metaphor works for you. But um, the perspective expanded, um, his perspective grew. And in, and in this way, um, they're, they're initiations. You could see them as initiations. They're initiations. All these rites of passage are initiations. And they're, they're, they're initiation into something. Um, 
And it's quite a helpful way of looking at experience. Any experience has the potential to be an initiation. Even experiences that could be quite painful, they can, they can be an initiation. Someone uh, once said to me that they felt that all, all problems in the spiritual life, um, or even life in general, are issues of perspective that our perspective is too limited for the situation we're in. And if we can expand our perspective, then what we perceive as the problem kind of changes. And uh, it starts to actually um, create a lot of freedom. It, it gives freedom. It gives uh, room for manoeuvre. It gives possibility. It gives creativity. It's, um Sangharakshita um, said in the lecture about mind reactive, mind creative. This is the move from the reactive mind to the creative mind. So we're going to be looking at these uh, different turning points, the, these initiations, and see how that resonates with our experience. Both we might look back on our life and see points that were had parallels or echoes and we might also there might be things going on right now for us um i i had an experience just recently of um needing to make quite a dramatic kind of u-turn on something having to sort of almost admit defeat about something and i've actually found it really helpful to be looking at the, the buddha's life story and we'll look at this when we'll um when we explore the giving up of asceticism, but the, the the Buddha made quite a major U-turn himself. He had to admit that he got something wrong and he had to sacrifice a certain amount. And I've actually found that really helpful in my current experience to have that kind of model available to me um, of, of admitting, yeah, I'm going to have to try something else here. And uh, my ego is going to get a little bit of a, a knock, but that's okay. This is an initiation into a bigger perspective. So it, it, it's then interestingly, it has the almost alchemical transformative effect of something that's sort of bad becomes an initiation into a bigger perspective. And this way, the, the, the Buddha's life story becomes like a map. It becomes like a really helpful map that we can kind of refer to. We, we're not we're not walking around northern India two and a half barefoot two and a half thousand years ago, but we've got this map, this archetypal map that we can then kind of um, almost offer up to our own current experience in this very different world of Zoom and international communication that we live in, but this, that's why these truths kind of resonate. Um, so we're going to look at the, the Buddha's life story as almost like you would a fairy tale. Some of you might have done some of this kind of work with uh, myself and Mandarava and Attila and, and other people where you take a fairy story and you kind of see the resonances, you see the archetypal resonances with, with your own experience. So we are going to look at the, the, the Buddha's life story as a fairy tale. And, and I mean, absolutely no disrespect by that because, you know, we, we use that term sometimes very derogatory. Oh, it's a fairy tale. Oh, it's a myth. You know, it's used to suggest that something's, not real somehow, not valid. Um, but I go back to that quote, myths are the things that which never happened but always are. Um, so by looking at the, the Buddha's life story, because we don't know the, um, the historical facts, there, 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 are, there are hints and guesses, as, as T.S. Eliot said, there are hints and guesses and... Uh, there's actually even very little archaeological evidence to go on, to be honest with you, because, um, because of the nature of the times. Um, so it is going to be looking at this. And I'm also going to 
mold together different versions. We're going to, I'm going to uh, join up as I do. I'm going to join up these different, these different versions um, again to give these different perspectives. So I'm not going to give a, a single clear narrative because that's not possible. And one of the ways we're going to do that is I'm going to give my perspective and Mandara is going to give her perspective. Um, so, and you're hopefully going to share your perspectives. And in that way, uh, an interesting conversation can emerge um, where we can explore different, different ways of seeing things. Because this way of um, working, so some of you might, might have done some dream work. I've, I've done quite a lot of dream work over the years, looking at dreams. And it's very interesting to look at dreams from different perspectives. And in dreams, often the perspective changes, don't you? Sometimes you're, you're looking out at the world and sometimes you're looking onto yourself. Sometimes you are yourself and other times you're somebody else. Sometimes you're a cat, sometimes you're a dog, sometimes you know, you're a spaceship. Um, we take on these different perspectives in the dream state. Um, and one way of working with dreams is to not just relate to the central figure, but to almost imagine the different perspectives from all the characters in the dream. So, I don't know, in a dream you're having an argument with somebody. Well, don't just view the dream from your your kind of you in the dream. Well, what's it like to view it from the person who's arguing with you in the dream? What's it like, um, Atlas is very good at this, what's it like to be the chair in that room? Maybe there's a picture on the wall. What's the perspective of that picture? What's the perspective of the tree outside the window? So we're going to... One of the ways we're going to look at the Buddha's life stories, we're not just going to look at the, the single figure of the Buddha. We're going to look at the kind of the landscape, the environment, the people around him. And what do they say? What perspectives do they bring? Um, I, I appreciate it's a bit of a kind of, uh, might be for some of you, might be a bit, of, a bit of a leap. But it's just a very, very interesting way of looking at the world, of looking at our experience. It's sort of de, in a sense, it starts to move us towards an experience of no self. Um, this kind of sense of there's not this just this one, you know, discrete being. There's this field of interconnectivity. There's this field of truth. Um, this field of imagination. One of the ways this helps, I think, is that it, it, in our day-to-day -day life, outside the dream state, it, it re-enchants the world. It turns the world into a magical place. Like I find it quite interesting, for example, um, I don't, in some ways, I don't just, I'm not seeing you on this screen. I've got you on gallery here. I'm seeing a whole world and I'm creating an image of you. I'm creating an idea, which is a complete fabrication of, oh, they're that sort of person. Oh, oh they, they like those books. They like that picture. Um, that's the view outside their window. I don't see this just a little discreet sort of cutout. I see a kind of a world. And... It's fascinating. It's absolutely kind of fascinating to see this and to experience it. So, yeah, let's look at the story in a way that includes the trees, the animals, the gods, the ghosts, uh, the in-laws. Um, they're all there. And, and this... Um, just to give a kind of illustration of this, um, I find it really interesting that all the uh, turning points, all the rite of passages, have the motif of um, 
a tree or a river somewhere in them. Um, or it's certainly maybe not all, maybe certainly most of them do. Um, and you could say, you know, the Buddha was walking around a fairly heavily forested landscape two and a half thousand years ago and there wasn't any running water. Um, so it's hardly surprising, which is a perfectly valid view. But I think it's also significant that, um, so let's take the tree, for example. Um, he's born under a tree. Um, he has the experience under the rose apple tree. The awakening, the enlightenment takes place under the Bodhi tree. Um, he spends a great deal of his time living and teaching underneath trees. Um, he, he dies between twin sow trees. It's, it, they're, they're there. So a tree is a tree, and also a tree is an image of uh, strength, stability, um, the heights and the depths of equilibrium. Um, and, and of course, in mythology, we've got the image of the world tree, the central axis, this, this significant place um, that many heroes and heroines and great teachers and mystics take their place on the world tree. Um, and similarly with rivers, you know, uh, the Buddha-to-be crosses a river when he goes forth in some accounts. Um, he has significant kind of ritual bathing in rivers uh, at different times. He, he offers his golden bowl, all of this I'll, I'll say more about later, to the river. Um, there's loads and loads of experiences of rivers. And of course, a river is an image in contrast to an image of a tree being quite static and stable, a river is an image of, of change, of impermanence, of insubstantiality, of fluidity, of movement. Um, so I find it interesting, you've immediately got this very rich um, archetypal imagery of these kind of two yin and yang um, energies or forces of, uh, of, of a sense of sort of balance between these different kind of uh, energetic ways of being. Um, and you've got a, the image of rivers, of course, and then it starts to um, enter the, the mythology, the imagery of, of the Dharma. You know, we, we talk about crossing the stream we talk about stream entry. Um, we, we have, you know, there's the image of um, the refuge tree. Um, so it starts to sort of, these images kind of percolate in our culture. Um, so I wear, there's a lot in all that. Um, I, I might have, uh, blown some of your minds or you might just be wondering what I'm talking about but hopefully through experiencing this stuff through um, dwelling on it meditating on it knitting on it whatever way you, you that, that you you find to engage with it that um, yeah you can experience some of these these multiple perspectives and, um, and just, just to finish off, that I find it very, very interesting that so many of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas have multiple eyes. I'm, uh, those of you who know the Rivendell Shrine, they've got this very beautiful, unfortunately you can't see it, but I can, uh, it's a very large tanker of white Tara that's at the other end of the Shrine Room. And... She has these um, seven eyes. She has an eye in her forehead, the two eyes, eye in each hand, um, and an eye each foot. And I've also got an image of Avalokiteshvara, and particularly the, the thousand armed Avalokiteshvara that has a thousand eyes. There's, a, there's an eye in each hand again. 
So you've an 11 heads. He's even got 11 heads that are facing in different directions. Um, so you've got these multiple perspectives uh, we, that really enrich the world, that really, really enrich the world. Um, so we're just going to explore those multiple perspectives through, through the life of the Buddha. Um, I've got my um, avatar of the Buddha here on the shrine with me. I've got, obviously, I've got more traditional rupa in front of this beautiful uh, woodland scene that uh, Mandarava's painted. And I'm surrounded by literal trees, so I'm in the forest with, with the Buddha. Uh, I've got green Tara, um, and I've got uh, a puppet of mine representing the Buddha who will um, each day embody the different stages. And over in Forest House, Mandarava has uh, another kind of image of, of the Buddha's life that she'll be exploring with us. Um, so you've already got these kind of two perspectives. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but just to give you a, just a few reflections, um, if you might find these helpful. I mean, I mean, do you believe there's one truth? Do you, do you really believe there's like one truth um, about any situation, about anything? Do you really believe there is one truth? Um, and what is truth? I mean, that's a big question. What is truth? What is truth to you? And you might, in relation to that, you might like, well, what is your relationship to myths and stories? Are, are they, you know, for some people, there are, there are a lot of sort of superstitious mumbo jumbo that's been added on to the Dharma. We need to, in this modern world, it all needs to be uh, cleared away. And we need to get to the facts. Um, I think if you're of that view, <laughs> you're in the wrong place, I'm afraid. Um, you're definitely in the wrong place. Uh, and, and do you think of the world as being enchanted? Do we live in this world of uh, multiple perspective, multiple ways of being? Mandarva's going to say um, much more about this later today and particularly explore it in the uh, in the ritual this evening but it's a good and there's not there's no right or wrong answers to any of this stuff i just think it's quite an interesting place to begin um what what is our what is our relationship to the world we live in big questions big big questions